Good morning and welcome to the news here on TV3 with me, Godwin Asidiba. Coming up, the headlines. <music> Attorney General and Minister of Justice, Goffred Dami, describes the anti-LGBT bill as unconstitutional. The Bank of Ghana withdraws forex support to importation of rice oil, among others, as government intensifies measures to improve local production. In Parliament, Finance Minister Ken Oferiata faces the censure committee today to open his defence. Later on the international front, authorities in the Nigeria's northwestern state of Kaduna have confirmed the death of a top militia leader during a shootout with the army. These and some other stories coming your way. Do stay with us. We're on DSTV channel 279, also streaming across social media, especially on Facebook at TV3 Ghana. Do find us and share your thoughts and comments with us. My name is Godwin Asiriba. The Bank of Ghana says it will no longer provide forex support for some food items imported into the country. A message from the central bank to commercial banks stated that forex for the importation of rice, vegetable oil, toothpicks, pasta fruits, bottled water, ceramics and tiles have been withdrawn. President Nanado Dankwe Kufuado on October 30 said government was going to prioritize the import of some products. He has, he has a recap and you should have a look. Requires that we take some more stringent measures. Requires that we take some more stringent measures to discourage the importation of goods that we can and do produce here. To this end, we will review the standards required for imports into the country. We will prioritize the imports, as well as review the management of our foreign exchange reserves in relation to imports of products such as rice, poultry, vegetable oil, toothpicks, pasta, fruit juice, bottled water, and ceramic tiles, and others, which with intensified government support and that of the banking sector can be manufactured and produced in sufficient quantities in Ghana. The Attorney General and Minister of Justice, Goffred Dame, has described parts of the anti-LGBTQI plus bill as unconstitutional. In an opinion submitted to the Constitutional Legal and Parliamentary Affairs Committee of Parliament, the Attorney General said the bill will face legal challenges when implemented. The, he added that some provisions of the bill will violate some fundamental human rights and freedoms, particularly the right of privacy if passed. The anti-LGBTQI bill seeks to decriminalize activities of persons who hold out as lesbian, gay, transgender, transsexual, or queer persons involved in the promotion of or advocacy and funding of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer-related activities as well, as persons who conduct surgical procedures to reassign as an individual to a particular gender or for medical purposes are to be prosecuted if the bill is approved. But the Attorney General says part of the bill violate some fundamental rights of freedom of expression, though it, has, it, though it hasn't been approved. Well, let's get some answers on this particular development on the phone to react to the statement from the Attorney General and the Minister of Justice, S.M. George, who is joining us on phone. He is the Member of Parliament for Ningo Pram Pram and one of the proponents of the anti-LGBTQ bill in Parliament. Good morning, Sam George. Very good morning to you. I mean, how do you react to this particular response from Dami? Well, it's um, it's welcome. It's, it's not uh, new. 
if you look at the date of this memo, you realize that we've had it in the, uh, it's been it's been in Parliament for over a month. I'm surprised it's now being leaked out to the media, but um, it, it's not new. There's nothing um, in there that is a cause for worry. The committee and the sponsors have met previously. Over the past four months, we've been meeting on this bill. We've been meeting and working on the bill, and a lot of the things that the Attorney General raises in his memo have already been dealt with by the committee. And even if you look at the memo, you realize that close to 80% of the memo agrees with the provisions of the bill. So uh, it's a welcome memo. We we have worked on most of the things that he has he raises. We don't agree with everything that he says, and um, that's the that's the parliamentary process. He's going to be welcome to the debate. The issues that we don't agree with him on, we'll debate them in the chamber. But would this position of his affect the fortune of the anti-LGBTQ bill? Not at all. There is nothing in his memo. That, and I've seen portions of the media claim that Attorney General no one is sitting down the bill. And I want to urge the media to stop the professionality and read. Because if you read the memo, you realize that. Not, don't read the, the, the conclu just the conclusion. Read the body of the memo. You would realize from the body of the memo that he agrees largely with our bill. Several times. He stated in his memo that this provision or that provision is not inconsistent with the Constitution, which means that it doesn't sound, the Constitution doesn't sound, it sits well with the Constitution. And so, I mean, the most, the, for me, the most controversial part of the bill, which um, were raised, the Attorney General agrees that they are, they are, they are permissible, for example, when you look at the advocacy part, where we were seeking to impose a duty on the media not to publish or broadcast information that seeks to promote LGBTQ. The Attorney General in his memo says that, yes, even though there are freedoms of expression, those freedoms are not absolute. The Attorney General himself quotes cases from the Supreme Court, for example, the Giba versus Attorney General case, where Justice Baining, the Lord Justice Baining, in his ruling, stated that no freedom is absolute in the 1992 Constitution. So the Attorney General himself agrees with the fundamentals of, of, our, of our memo, of our bill. So what's the way forward for the bill? Well, the way forward is forward. Um, we were supposed to meet yesterday with the Attorney General um, and the committee. Unfortunately, because the leadership of the committee is engaged in the ad hoc special committee um, on the censure of Kenoforiata, that meeting couldn't happen. We're looking for that meeting to happen next week. Like I said, a lot of work has gone on quietly um, without the knowledge of the media. A lot of people have speculated that we have abandoned the course. But I'm confident that before Parliament rises, this, this, uh, this seating that will be in December, the committee's report will be laid, and then that will begin the clause-by-clause -clause consideration. Given the budget hearings, we don't expect the clause-by-clause -clause, um, debates to happen this year, but we expect it to happen in January when Parliament will be due. All right, thank you very much for speaking to us. Sam George has been one of the men who has been spearheading this particular action in Parliament. Away from that, it is a day of accountability as Finance Minister Ken Oforiata defends himself before the Censure Committee in Parliament against claims of conflict of interest and illicit transfer of state funds, among other things. The minority has accused the troubled Minister of egregious economic mismanagement of the economy. So what happened was we considered that opinion um, thoroughly. Um, we explored all the laws, in our opinion, that border around this issue. And we still came to an independent opinion, which we stand by on any day, that those revenues ought to have formed part 
of the petroleum revenues of Ghana and ought to have been deposited first in the petroleum holding fund and not any other account. So for us, it was contrary to law for that money to have been deposited in any account, if at all. Meanwhile, the Ghana National Petroleum Corporation says the finance minister committed no wrong in depositing the amount in an offshore account. Deputy CEO Joseph Darcy was testifying at the ad hoc committee. Was any money paid into an offshore account? The 100 million, was it paid into an offshore account? So, so Honorable Chair, I think, I think the word offshore, when we use, I mean, for those who are bankers, I mean, you can even have an offshore account in Ghana. So, I think the word, when we say offshore, sometimes I get a bit confused because the Bank of Ghana has certain categorizations of uh, what you call it, foreign currency. And so, what we call FCA, are offshore account. But to the extent that uh, the, the question relates to uh, receipts from uh, from sale of crude, yeah, it was paid into an account held at Ghana International Bank in London. Okay, and who made the payment? So the buyer, the buyer of the crude. So buyers of the crude, even in the case of PHF, the buyers of the crude pay, pay directly into the PHF. So they pay directly into whichever account that you did today for them to pay. What's an housing minister say? They have no knowledge and answers regarding the National Cathedral Project. NDC MP for Lower Manya Krobo Ebenezer Talabi had three questions standing in his name regarding the project. But responding to the floor of the House, Deputy Minister for Works and Housing, Abdullah Abanga, said the project is outside the ministry's purview. Mr. Speaker, the question number 1320. In the name of Mr. the Honorable Ebenezer Talavi, relating to the National Cathedral, is an activity that is outside the remit of the Ministry of Works and Housing. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Works and Housing have therefore written to this House in a letter on the 11th of November 2022 to the principal assistant clerk and head of table office to draw their attention to this matter. A swift response to what has become a controversial project being undertaken by the government. That response from the deputy minister did not go down well with the NDC MPs. I agree that they are not the substantive ministry to answer questions on the project. But this being a house of record, it speaks of some letter that says, some communication that says that they are not responsible. So if we can inform the house, so that going forward, we'll be able to direct the question to the appropriate ministry. I, I, I think at least you should be able to do that. Uh, you have indicated that we should give you time to do consultations. This being a house of records, can you please give us an indication? That has been the practice and tradition in this house. When you say time, you give a period. So is it one week, is it two weeks, so that we will know and then come back with our questions? Demolishing houses to build cathedral is works. And housing is involved. Mr. Speaker, if not Ministry of Works, tell us which ministry we should ask of questions relating to such public works as the construction of a cathedral. Which, which, which other ministry? Not roads, not chieftaincy, not energy, not education, not foreign affairs, not health. Mr. Speaker, it has to be works. It has to be works. So, works ministry is the proper ministry to ask the question, and they must answer it today, Mr. Speaker. The second deputy speaker, Andrew Isiama, in his ruling, asked the table office to address the question to the appropriate office. Honorable members, my directive is that the table office should raise direct the question to appropriate, appropriate office, please. The minority in parliament is asking the Ghana Standards Authority to hasten slowly in the implementation of the Vehicle Certificate of Conformance, which takes effect on January 1 next year. Ranking member on the Roads and Transport Committee, 
Kwame governs Abuja says any attempt to implement the policy without broader consultation will impose untoward hardship on Ghanaians. I want to call upon the Ghana Standards Authority to hasten slowly, probably suspend the implementation on this basis. They, they must learn from uh, the hasty implementation of the larger vehicle tax. They must learn from the uh, hasty suspension of the collection of road tolls. They must learn from uh, other laws that were passed in this house and without adequate preparation, consultation and public education implemented and drove us all into problem. As we speak, that uh, 891 that we are talking about talked about the fact that uh, we are going to set up uh, uh, a new system where brand new vehicles are assembled in this country uh, to make them more available. The first question is, how many companies are assembling vehicles in this country and what are the choices of vehicles available to the, to the Ghanaian? Are those vehicles at prices that the ordinary Ghanaian, the, a journalist, a teacher, a nurse can afford? Even thinking of when we pass the law and the, the state of the economy today, even if you are selling those vehicles for $5,000, do you know what $5,000 means to the average Ghanaian that will buy them? Then we go to the, the point of uh, used vehicles uh, limited. Mm. Imagine if by the, the, the 1st of January, you say that people cannot uh, import vehicles. What does that mean to the economy? Mm. What does that mean to the used uh, car, uh, uh, traders? I don't think we, have, we are there yet. Nobody is kicking against the law, but I don't think we have done enough to make the implementation of this law smooth enough. So I am, that's the reason I'm calling on them to suspend this implementation and do further consultation. Let's now cross over to the Ashanti Regional Capital, Kumasi, as constant hikes in the prices of liquefied petroleum gas, LPG, is adding up to the woes of some food vendors in Kumasi. The product has seen more than 100% increment between January and November this year. Ibrahim Abubakar has more in this report. Just a month ago, filling a 14.5 kg cylinder cost around 170 cities. Today, you need 280 cities to fill the same cylinder. The frequent adjustment of LPG prices has become a serious concern for Hussein, a food vendor at Ainsain Estate in Kumasi. The 34-year-old says he now has to spend double of what he used to spend on gas alone. Things are really hard for the food vendors. Initially, the food uh, items are affecting our business and today the gas issue too is affecting. We have no any other option than to increase the price of the food because we cannot use charcoal to fry the rice. It's the gas and the gas is the fastest thing we can use in the system. This, in addition to high cost of food staff, has affected the price of a plate of rice. The least price has moved from 15 cities to 25 cities in just a month. For Catherine, a chop bar operator at Oforikrom, the price instability is having a huge toll on her business. She uses not less than five gas cylinders at the same time. Ukraine, they say gas is someone dear and thing and not for my cra. It's not easy for us now. All our work now depend on the use of gas. The price instability of the products is having a toll on our business. Just a month ago, I was spending thousand cities every week on gas, but last week I spent thousand three hundred and eighty cities on the products. I don't even know how much I will spend the following week. Adding the cost of the gas to the food also makes it expensive. We only plead with government to do something about it. At Aloga Junction, most of these taxi drivers have converted their petrol engine to gas engine. The motive was to enable them to spend less on fuel, but that is no more the case with the current price of LPG. Let me talk gas, 50 city. Let me the whole day. 
but I feel any day. LPG is now expensive. I used to buy between 120 and 140 Ghana cities for a day, but now I buy between 200 and 250 Ghana cities. There isn't much difference between the price of petrol and gas for now. In January, a kilogram of LPG was sold at 8.6 CDs, translating into 124 CDs for regular 14.5 kg cylinder. By November, same kilogram is selling at 19.3 CDs. Well, that is not the end. Consumers are being told to brace up and pay for more for the same quantity of LPG in the coming weeks. Ibrahim Abubakar, TV3 News. Kumasi. Let's do some international news now. The authorities in Nigeria's northwestern state of Kaduna have confirmed the death of a top militia leader during a shootout with the army on Sunday. A state government spokesperson said Kachala Gadawu was amongst cause of gunmen killed when they attacked a military facility. It's alleged he was responsible for multiple kidnappings, killings and illicit drug operations. It came as the Nigerian Air Force said it had carried out airstrikes on bandits' hideouts in several locations within the state, killing scores of them. With three months to go before Nigeria's presidential election, security forces appear to have stepped up the attacks on suspected gangs. A new study has found that climate change severely worsened heavy rains that caused large-scale flooding across Swabies in Nigeria and Niger this year, killing hundreds of people. The floods were recorded as the worst ever in the two countries. The report by World Weather Attribution says extreme seasonal rainfall and the release of water from dams caused the flooding from June to October. They concluded the event was made of 80 times more likely by climate change. Almost 1.5 million people were displaced, hundreds of thousands of homes were swept away, and over half a million hectares of farmlands were devastated by the floods. We end the news here. My name is Godwin Asideva, the best morning show.